All right, welcome everybody to this tutorial on explainable constraint solving. My name is Professor Tias Junes from KU Leuven, and I will be giving this tutorial with uh, Ineas Bleu and Dimos Tsouros. So, the title of this tutorial is a hands-on tutorial, and you can take that very literally, because this entire presentation is actually an executable Jupyter notebook, meaning that all of the examples that you will see are run and generated live, uh, allowing you to start playing with it immediately uh, if you wish. Okay, so before we can talk about explainable constraint solving, and what do we mean with constraint solving? <coughs> Constraint solving is a family of techniques for solving combinatorial optimization problems. And the typical kind of paradigm that is used in constraint solving is that of <coughs> model plus solve. So the model in this case is a formal specification of the problem consisting of decision variables, constraints over those variables of things that are allowed and not allowed, as well as an objective function that expresses the quality of the solution. Given such a specification, you can use a range of state-of-the-art solving techniques to find the solution. This can be used, for example, to solve um, various forms of, uh, of uh, rich constraint, um, vehicle routing problems, to solve scheduling problems, to solve planning problems, timetabling problems, and much, much more. So this is the standard paradigm, but now the question is, imagine that you've created a constraint specification, a model, and you call the solver. What if this model is unsatisfiable? What if the solver doesn't actually provide any answer other than that there exists no solution? Or what if it does return a solution, a routine, like in the top uh, over there, but this is actually an unexpected solution to you, or it contains elements that you do not want? Or what if, as a user, you actually want to change some part uh, of that answer or even of the specification? So these kinds of questions, they are becoming more and more important because they fit within the concept of trustworthy and explainable AI. Namely, that our AI systems should not just be used to provide a solution, but that we should be able to trust them and that it should be possible that these uh, systems explain why certain solutions uh, come out. And so uh, a, main, a main idea within this trustworthy and explainable AI and constraint solving uh, in this case is about making AI systems more human aware. And human aware means that they respect the human agency, the fact that the decisions that such a system uh, proposes are actually, should actually be suggestions and that as a human we have the agency, we still have the control to change some of those decisions. And that means especially a focus more towards support, uh, so supporting, using AI techniques to support users in their decision making. And so part of that, and so what, what, we're, what we're working towards and what we like to extend in terms of capabilities of our systems is to have our systems uh, being able to provide explanations and offer learning opportunities both on the user side and on the system side. And so another uh, key thing is that this acknowledges that even though we might use exact solvers that can compute the optimal solution that is guaranteed to satisfy all of the constraints, when we model a problem, this is still a model. It is still only an approximation of everything that is happening in the real world. And because it is a model, it also means that the result might be undesirable, that the model is incomplete, for example, uh, or that there are surprises, surprising interactions within it. So uh, this work fits within the, the general concept of, of explainable AI, which is a, a, a hot topic in AI right now. And I'll just give a, a, a few brief highlights. And so um, I would say that uh, the, the DARPA XAI challenge really put the theme of explainable AI on the, on the global research agenda. Um, so even in within the call of that, uh, of that DARPA uh, program, and it was written that every explanation is set within a context that depends on da 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 da. And so from the very beginning, this idea that explanations are domain independent were very much there. So that project had a large focus on uh, explanations for machine learning, but there was also very nice work um, um, by Maria Fox in 2017 on explainable planning. So not for machine learning systems, but rather for planning systems, path planning, 
uh, and classical planning and so forth. And so there this argument that even for these symbolic reasoning systems, we need to be able to trust those systems. We need interaction and transparency with respect to the solving uh, that was really nicely uh, described there. Um, also, uh, a landmark work was of uh, Tim Miller, 2018, where explainable AI behavior have inmates running the asylum. So he, he actually looked at the social sciences and what does an explanation mean in the social sciences and how do social science researchers investigate concepts of explanations and what an explanation is and how it should be evaluated. And so I think that a key insight uh, of, of that paper and, and, and the argument there is that an explanation should really be seen as, as having three components, namely someone explains something to someone. And, and that's, that's a very helpful uh, way to look at it. And then more recently, there's many, many uh, tutorials, including this one, on uh, uh, tutorials and surveys, on methods for explaining specifically machine learning systems, black box machine learning systems. And so I would say that the vast majority of work and attention these days is going towards explainable machine learning models, but many of our other AI systems, including symbolic ones, they also are in need uh, of being able to be more explainable and more, uh, more interactive in that manner. Now, within the constrained programming community, uh, explaining already is something that, explaining constrained propagation is already an existing concept, but it is very different from what we are covering in this tutorial. And so it's a concept from lazy class generation, sometimes called CP set solvers. And so an explanation in, in that context, in these uh, CP set type solvers, is um, uh, the following. So every time a propagator determines a domain change of a variable, meaning that one value uh, is removed from the domain, it records a clause that explains that domain change. And so it's a, it's a low level, it's a technical uh, concept. And so if we map it back to the someone, something, someone, then the someone here, what is being explained is one individual propagator. The something, the format of the explanation is also uh, very specific, namely it has to be a clause that can be given to the underlying set solver. And then that someone to which the explanation is given is indeed, as I just said, a set solver and not a person. And so the, the purpose is to have much more propagation coming from it and not really having an, 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 an explanation that, that a human could, uh, could interpret. So these types of explanations, explanations at the constraint propagation level is not what we will focus on. We will talk about explanations at the entire constraint program, at the combinatorial optimization problem specification level. And so we call this here explainable constraint programming. And in general, the type of question that we wish to answer is why X? And this, this X, this could be a solution. And so why is this a solution? or it could be the fact that there is no solution. And actually, the types of questions uh, that you can ask and how to best categorize them, that is still to be defined. And, um, but if we look at, at uh, the research that's been going on, we see a kind of pattern in a, in a division in three, three rough groups. And the first group is that of causal or deductive explanations, which try to explain how a certain solution was derived. A second family uh, of techniques focus on, uh, within constraint programming, focus on contrastive explanation. And a contrastive explanation asks why X and not some other alternative Z. And so this uh, contrasts with another alternative. And then a third category, uh, uh, which we here call conversational explanations, also model reconciliation type explanations, they are more interactive, and here it's about iteratively refining both the explanation and the model. All right. So if we look at that first category, this causal explanation, then the mode of interaction that we see there is this. So you have a user, and we assume that this user has specified uh, a problem, eh, constraint specification, a model, gives this to the system. The system then computes an answer, which can either be that there is no solution or a specific solution. And then the user asks, okay, explain huh, why or, or why not. 
And then the, the explanation is returned. For example, if the question is why is there no solution, this could be a minimal unsatisfiable un, uh, subset. And that is the end of that interaction. But what, what then? As so the, the system has offered an explanation, a, a subset of constraints that is not satisfiable, and what then? So there's actually four possibilities. And in the best case, the user sees, ah, this is why, and the user is happy. Uh, in case the problem is unsatisfiable, it's unlikely that they will be happy. Uh, but maybe, ah, this is a good solution because, um, because otherwise the objective function changed by this much and so forth. And so it could be that the user receives the explanation and is happy. A second option is that um, the user actually changes the answer and uses that. So the system might provide a solution. The user might ask, okay, why is, is this person not allocated at that moment in time? And then the user can see the explanation, say, okay, well, I'll, I'll just make that switch anyway at the solution level, and that's the one that I will deploy in practice. And so this is a pure solution interaction. There is no involvement in the solver here. Uh, a lot of the companies that we talk to uh, do this kind of uh, interaction often. The third type of interaction is where uh, the explanation actually provides insight into the user, into the problem specification, and making the user realize that the specification might be incomplete, or that there's something in the specification that needs to change. And so the user better understands how to model the problem and changes uh, the problem uh, in response. And this, this is only possible in the case that the user is also an expert modeler. And then the fourth uh, possibility is that the user receives an explanation and this raises more questions or invites the user to interact more with the system and give feedback or, uh, or dynamically change some parts. And so this is an interact, that is more of an interaction, a conversational type of uh, explanation and continuous interaction. All right, so that sketches a bit the, the, the uh, or like the, the framework in which we, we, in which we put this, uh, this tutorial. Um, for the rest of the tutorial, I will start by explaining uh, the running example that we will use here, a nurse rostering problem. We'll say a bit more about the system on which, uh, on which these explanation techniques are implemented. Um, and then we, we grouped the rest in two parts. One part will focus especially on explaining um, models that are unsatisfiable, and so what if the answer from the system there, what if it is unsat? And there we will see causal explanations as well as uh, forms of conversational explanations. And in the second part, uh, we assume that the system uh, will return a solution, answers a solution, and then we will look at different kind of explanations that people have investigated, including causal explanations and contrastive explanations. All right, good. So let's have a look at that running example. So the model here will be a nurse rostering, uh, a nurse scheduling problem. And so in nurse scheduling, the goal is to assign um, shifts and holidays to nurses. So we have this timetable, and for each uh, for each of the time slots, we need to say whether a nurse takes that specific shift or not. And so each shift, uh, each nurse has specific restrictions and preferences and so does the hospital with, uh, with respect to uh, the number of, of uh, required nurses at certain moments of the day and so forth. All right, so the data that we will be using in this tutorial, it's open data, it's, uh, it's benchmarks from this uh, schedulingbenchmark.org website, uh, which has various test instances from various sources, including industrial collaborators and scientific publications. And so we're using <coughs> one of those instances, uh, in this case, uh, we'll, we'll use this instance one, uh, which is fairly small, which helps uh, on the visualizations. All right, so the data, if, uh, we load in the data, and then we can look at the staff. And so there's a specific um, uh, number of staff, eight people uh, that are given, including the maximum and minimum consecutive shifts, uh, and so forth and so forth. All right, so what else does the data contain? So it shows that in this case, in this specific instance, we have 14 days over which we need to schedule nurses, and there's one shift type. 
So that's uh, this type of problem with these eight nurses. And so what we show here, for example, is the, the days off. So this shows when which nurse requested which days off. There's also this, that type of information. <coughs> so to give a bit of an overview, so in terms of uh, constraints and preferences uh, that come from the hospital, we have the number of nurses that need to be assigned uh, at one specific time slot. We have the maximum number of shifts, also maximum number of weekend shifts, maximum number of consecutive days off, and so forth and so forth. If we look at, um, at the constraints or, or preferences uh, that are oriented towards the nurse, so every nurse has specific days that they request, uh, that, they, that they have to be off duty, as well as uh, specific shifts that they would like, uh, that they prefer, that they would like to have. All right, so that's uh, for the example that we will be using here. Um, so we re-implemented a lot of existing uh, explanation techniques within one uh, well, within this library that we're using uh, in this tutorial. And that itself is based upon the CPMPy constraint mo programming and modeling system. So CPMPy, it's a, a constraint programming and modeling library, uh, CPM, in Python. Um, and some of its, some of, uh, of what makes it uh, stand out is that it's based on NumPy and it allows uh, also for direct solver access. So the features that we will use here is that because it is based on NumPy, which is the standard uh, Python uh, data representation, it's very easy to integrate um, both the model and the solutions with various visualization tools. And we'll use Pandas, Matplotlib, and so forth. It also means that we can do object-oriented programming, and we're doing constraint programming, so it's still declarative, we're still specifying constraints, but we can wrap that nicely into different objects, uh, class. Um, classes, factories, and so forth. Another property we will use is that we will repeatedly ask a solver to solve a subset of constraints, so different types of subsets. And so this requires us to be able to repeatedly and incrementally call solvers, which this library allows. And so it allows it both for set, uh, set solvers and for mixed integer programming solvers, uh, which we will use a lot as well. So that's why it's based on that library. We are also the developers of that library, <laughs> coincidentally. Okay, so let's have a look at how we can solve the nurse rostering in CPMPy. So the variables uh, that we will use here is the assignment of shift types to nurses. And so we will have, as you can see here, so we're de declaring a nurse view on, on, uh, on, our, on the decision that need to be, that need to be taken. And as I said before, this library is uh, fully compatible with NumPy arrays. So we will define an integer decision variable and we give it a certain shape, a certain dimension. And in this case, the dimension is that there will be as many rows as we have staff and there will be as many columns as we have days for which uh, shifts need to be assigned. So that is the dimension of that array. And then for each element of that matrix, and so for one specific nurse and one specific day, we have to decide what shift that nurse gets. Zero means that the shift is that the nurse is free, and then in this case we only have one shift type, and so the other option is that they are assigned to that shift, uh, to that shift, the day shift, shift one. All right. Okay, so if we have visualized this, so you can name your variables and then looks uh, as a numpy array. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's look uh, just a little bit at the, at the syntax being used. Let's look at, for example, the constraint of specific days of duty. So in this case, we have our data frame, the one that I visualized just before. We can ask all the employee IDs and all the day IDs. And then as a constraint, we can say that within the nurse view, um, the specific employee of that row in our data and the specific day combination uh, of that specific row has to be zero. So that specific combination of nurse and day cannot be assigned to the day shift, it has to be zero, it has to be free. 
an unorganized property that we added specifically for uh, this type of work on, uh, on explanations is that you can also set a textual description of what that constraint represents. So this is the part that the constraint solver will use and this is the part uh, that, you can, that you can show, uh, for example, to a user when asking for an explanation. Oh, I should run this. Um, right, so we, as you can see on this line, we print the constraint, in which case it will print the, the human level description. And so we see the same table as before, but this time with that uh, nice human oriented um, uh, specification. And Megan should not work on day zero, uh, Catherine, and so forth and so forth. These are artificial names, don't worry. Okay. So another constraint, for example, a bit more involved, is the maximum consecutive shift constraint. Again, uh, for every nurse, uh, we, have, we have given, uh, we know what the maximum consecutive shift that that, nur that that nurse can work is. And so we can get that from our data. And then the way that we post this is that if, if that's the maximum number of days, then that means that if you add one more day, then at least, then not all of those days the nurse can work. Right, because if that would be the case, it would be beyond the max shifts. So if we take every time window that has one day more than the max consecutive days, then we have to require that at least one of those, the nurse is free. That is what this, uh, what this specifies. It, it might require uh, a bit longer to look at it, but so we count within that window how many times the nurse is free, so that there's a zero here, and we say that this has to be at least one. Again, we have the symbolic and uh, the specification that the constraint solver will use, and then we also add this human-oriented human description. All right, so as I said before, here we're, we actually implemented all of these constraints as part of this nice uh, factory object which which we can create uh, nurse rostering schedules. And so if we then call a solver, to uh, solve the problem, in this case we use or tools, then the model and uh, the, the solver says true, there is a solution. Okay, so far so good. So let's have a look at that solution and we can, we can look at the value that each of the decision variables uh, received and then we get this rather raw array um, which you can stare at, but as I said before, because these are all NumPy arrays, it's also very easy to just use um, existing visualization techniques, in this case, uh, pandas. And so if we do that, then we can actually visualize this matrix in, in a much nicer way. So again, F stands for free, D stands for the day shift, uh, and this is the solution uh, that was found. All right, so I've explained you what model we will use. I've told you a bit about the system, and now I'm happy to invite Ignas uh, to, to say more about uh, explanations for UNSAT. Thank you. So indeed, we now have a very nice uh, modeling library and we know more or less what explanations are. So let's take a look at some examples, some example queries uh, or questions users might have uh, when, when presented with a model or, uh, or a solution or the like thereof. So the first part will be explaining unsets, so explaining the lack of a solution to a, to a user. So um, we can very easily um, accomplish an unsatisfiable uh, model if we uh, post all of the preferences, all of the soft constraints, as it's uh, often called in optimization problems, uh, as a hard constraint. Uh, so it means that, for example, the requests of nurses are considered uh, a constraint. Um, and well, very likely in these type of problems, they will not be um, uh, all satisfiable. So if we do that, um, in, in our nice factory, we have a, um, a method called get decision model. And so here we don't have an optimization mo uh, problem, but just um, a decision model uh, with some constraints. And we sol if we solve it, well, solve us as false, there is, uh, there is actually no solution. So, well, now what, right? Um, we have our model, but we don't have a solution. So um, what we can do, well, we can just have a look at the constraints, right? This is 
very declarative. Uh, we have even a very nice description. Um, so if we stare at this long enough, I guess you will be able to figure out why it's, um, why it's unsatisfiable, but these are almost 170 constraints. That's not really um, what I would like to do in my day. So instead, we can try to trim the model down to um, a minimal unsatisfiable subset of constraints. So um, this will very much minimize what you have to look at as a, as a user. Um, while still remaining uh, the explanation for one of the conflicts in the, in the constraints, because there can be many, as we will see later. So how do you compute such an um, unsatisfiable subset or minimal unsatisfiable subset? Well, one of the um, main uh, algorithms to do so, or one of the easiest algorithms, is to use a deletion-based uh, MUS algorithm, which uh, we can of uh, course, implementing CPMPy. Uh, and so the, the main idea behind this um, algorithm is that for each constraint, you check, well, can I leave it out while remaining unset or not? And if that's the case, uh, then I just leave it out. And if not, I have to keep it. Um, so I can run this. Um, but we also implemented a incremental version of this uh, in CPMPy, so you don't have to write the code yourself. You can just uh, call cpmpy.tools.mus, and this will uh, give you that same functionality. So if we do that, we use the R tool solver here, um, and we call this, this mus tool on our set of constraints. We get uh, much less constraints, so instead of 168 uh, in the entire model, we only have 11 constraints now, and again, we can have a look at it and see well, why is this unsatisfiable, and you will uh, be able to figure it out if you spend a little more time on this. Um, but of course, as uh, Dia said, we can also just uh, visualize these constraints, right? So in this case, we have uh, 11, 11 constraints, uh, well, some requests, which are the green boxes. Um, the, the blue boxes means that um, Kevin can only work one of those uh, weekends, for example, um, and uh, the, the circulated uh, red boxes mean that well, the, the shift has to be covered by five nurses, et cetera. Um, so that's very nice. Um, but many, many muses may exist. So one mus shows one conflict in the constraints, but there may be many conflicts. Um, so, well, what can you do? You can just enumerate all of the muses, right? Um, I'll start running this already. Um, so this takes a while, but you can find a lot of muses in uh, quite uh, a short time, especially if you use uh, incremental solvers, like the exact solver, which I do not have installed, I think. Um, so we use uh, OR tools in this case. Um, and you will be able to find uh, several muses, some which may uh, be easier to understand or, or more difficult to understand. And in this case, for example, we found four muses, which uh, you can have a look at. Um, so the question is, well, which of these muses do we show? Um, so, as I said, there are many, many, many muses. For this problem, only uh, there are more than 100,000 muses. We stopped the algorithm after 100,000. Um, and many of these are super, super large, like 61 constraints even, and some of them are very small. So, instead of enumerating all of these, um, all of these muses, let's find the smallest one directly, right? We want to minimize the cognitive burden for a user, so let's find a minimal or a smallest minimal satisfiable subset. Um, and before I can explain how we find such a minimal uh, unsatisfiable subset, which is uh, smallest in a set of number of constraints, I have to uh, say a little bit more about um, other types of subsets of constraints. So we've seen MUS, a um, trimmed down model of the, of, uh, the conflict, uh, but we also have these things called um, MSSs and MCSs, which stands for Maximal Satisfiable Subset and maximum, uh, Minimal Correction Subset. So a Minimal Correction Subset means that if you remove those constraints from the model, whatever remains will be satisfiable, will have a solution. And of course, that uh, whatever remains is then a Maximal Satisfiable Subset. And there is this very nice um, hitting set duality that is very well known within the community uh, between muses and uh, correction subsets, which says that, well, every um, mus is a hitting set to all of the correction subsets. Um, and it also means that um, if you find the smallest hitting set to all of these correction subsets, 
well, you will find the smallest mass, right? So we now have converted problem from finding all muses and picking the smallest one to uh, finding all correction subsets and then uh, finding the smallest hitting set. Um, again, there may be many, many, many correction subsets, so this is not very efficient. Um, and actually, we can um, do this incrementally. So by finding some correction subsets and then finding a hitting set to it, we can um, find this incrementally. Um, and so what would such an algorithm look like? Well, we start with a empty set of hitting, of sets to hit, um, and then we will uh, try to uh, find a hitting set to it. Um, and once we find such a set, we will check if the constraints in that hitting set are satisfiable or not. If they are not satisfiable, good, we have found our unsatisfiable subset. If they are, well, then we take the complement of it, and there's a small optional step in uh, to to make this a bit more efficient, but I'll not go into detail here. So we take the complement of our satisfiable subset, which means we get a correction subset, huh? the, the right part, the right blue part in the, in the previous figure. And we will add that correction subset to our sets to hit, and then we iterate. So we get a kind of a ping pong um, effect between our set solver and our uh, hitting set solver, uh, which can be very nicely implemented in uh, CPMPy as well. All right, so we know how to uh, compute this, so let's uh, just do it, right? Um, we call it uh, SMUS here for smallest MUS. And this is a bit of a harder problem, so it also takes a bit longer uh, compared to uh, finding just a unsatisfiable subset. And now we have found a subset with um, three constraints, which is much easier to, to comprehend compared to the, I think it was 11 in the previous one. So again, we can simply uh, visualize this. So now we have uh, two nurses that, has a day, that have a day off. Um, and we know that uh, this Tuesday, there should be seven nurses working, which is not possible as there are only eight nurses. So very easy to um, explain this conflict. But what if even the smallest mus or the, the most easiest to understand mus is still too difficult, right? It can be that for, for some larger problems, um, this, is, this is still very, very hard to understand. Um, so what we can do is we can actually split up this MUS into smaller steps uh, and explain what um, s individual constraints uh, propagate or what the effect of um, individual constraints are uh, with respect to the, to the decision variables. And uh, this is called stepwise explanations, uh, and there is a publication uh, about this on the on the CP uh, conference uh, last year. So if we dissect this MUS, then we can actually explain in much easier steps um, how, how the, the conflict is constructed. Um, so let's do that um, here as well. So again, we've just found a MUS. Let's say this is the one we, we would like to explain. Um, and then we will try to find a uh, sequence of the SMUS. So we found the sequence of length 11, so 11 small steps, and let's uh, take a look at how exactly this, this, uh, this sequence looks. So the first um, step, will we propagate the constraint that Robert requests to work um, on a shift of on the, the, the first Friday of the, the scheduling period, which means, well, okay, there is a, a day shift assigned there. Second step, we propagate very similar to uh, Wednesday, um, then also on Tuesday. Um, then Catherine uh, has a day off on Saturday the 1st, which means, well, that, uh, that decision variable is uh, assigned to, to free. Um, then Kevin also has a request that he uh, does not want to, uh, that he wants to work, sorry, on the, on the second uh, Sunday. Um, Again, Robert has some requests to work. Um, now this, uh, this box constraint that I talked about uh, earlier as well. So Kevin should only work at least uh, one weekend. And if he well, has to work the, the second weekend, that means he cannot work the first weekend. So these two are actually um, assigned to free, but we are only interested in the, in the first one, as you will see in a few steps. Uh, then Richard also has a day off on that particular Saturday. 
um, and Robert requested to uh, work on Tuesday. And then we have this, uh, this max consecutive uh, shift constraint, so it means that, well, Robert has worked all week, so he has to have a day off uh, on Saturday. So that one is also um, assigned to, to free. But then we have a problem, of course, because we know that this um, shift has to be covered by five nurses, which is not possible if all of these um, shifts are already assigned to, to free. So this is a much easier way to understand. It's a bit, it's a bit longer, of course, but it, the, the, the steps that you have to uh, comprehend as a user are much, much easier um, and much smaller. So that's very nice. Uh, we know how to explain a MUS, but well, how do you pick a MUS? So we have seen how to pick a smallest MUS, um, but you can also um, have some other type of uh, constraints or uh, objective um, value, uh, functions, sorry, about how you want your uh, conflict to look like. Um, and you can uh, find such preferred MUSs using uh, QuickExplain, which is a very, very well-known um, algorithm that we very recently also added to the, to the CPMPy library, so we can, um, we can call it as well. Um, and for that to do, uh, or to, to find a preferred uh, subset of constraints using QuickExplain, you have to define an ordering of your constraints. Uh, and we do this, in this case, by the define order function. Um, and we say that, well, if the uh, constraint um, is about days off of a, of a nurse, we don't prefer it. We want to keep it away from our conflict. We don't really want to mess with, uh, with vacation days. Uh, so we would like to have a, a conflict, or to, to find a conflict that doesn't include any of these, of these days off. Um, and so if we, if we run this, um, it might also take a while, yes. So indeed, we now find some completely different MUS compared to the smallest one or, uh, or the one with 11 constraints, but this one indeed doesn't, um, uh, does not contain any of the, of the day off um, shift uh, requests or, or indeed um, holiday days. And so if we um, visualize this, this is some type of other MUS. And this is very flexible, right? You can define orderings uh, as, as you like. Um, this is only, only one of the, of the types or one of the IDs we had uh, for, for exploiting this quick explain algorithm for this particular use case. All right, so we have seen causal explanations. So why something is unset uh, and derive or deduce why uh, there is some kind of, of conflict in the constraints. But very often this will not be the end of the um, of the interaction, right? You will know, okay, so this is unsatisfiable. I understand why it's unsatisfiable. Now I want to do something about it, right? So the idea is how can we change the model such that there is a solution? Um, and well, we have um, seen already um, how we can do this using correction subset. I will, I will go back into that in a, in a minute. But um, the idea is that you have soft constraints and hard constraints. And we only want to um, remove soft constraints, for example. So we have some kind of partitioning between those. Um, and well, we only want um, soft constraints to be removed from the model. So um, we will find a correction subset over these soft constraints, right? Um, so again, if you have a correction subset and you remove all of these constraints, you will be left with a satisfiable subset um, which, which has a solution. So how can you compute such a um, correction subset directly? Uh, actually very similar to uh, the deletion-based MUS approach, but then a grow-based uh, correction set approach. So you'll try to add constraints uh, very greedily to a subset, if it stays satisfiable, well, good, you can just add it. If it's uh, unsatisfiable bec uh, because we added that constraint, then we cannot not include it in the, in the uh, satisfiable part, and so we have to include it in the correction subset part. So this is uh, one of the algorithms that you can use for that. So if we do this, um, well, then you will find some correction subset that says if I remove all of these cover constraints from my model, then I will find a solution. So, very nice if we do that. 
um, you remove those constraints and you find a solution. Uh, that's very good, um, but this might not always be, be very nice, right? For example, here on, uh, on Sunday, there's only one nurse uh, that's working. This is not very, very nice for that nurse. Uh, w what if many uh, patients show up? That's not, uh, not a very good experience, I think. Um, so instead of finding um, just a correction subset, we can also find the smallest correction subset. So a correction subset that says, well, these are the minimal number of constraints that has to be removed. So very similar to the smallest uh, conflict, we can also find the smallest uh, correction subset. Uh, and this can be done by uh, finding, again, the, sm the largest uh, satisfiable subset, which is similar to the, the max CSP uh, solution of this problem. Um, and again, we can also implement this in a, in a very easy uh, function. So if we do that, uh, it turns out that actually if we just remove these four constraints instead of all of the cover constraints that we had before, then you will also find a uh, solution. Let's have a look at the corrected model now. Uh, this is not very nice either. Now, this Sunday doesn't have any nurses at all. So hospital will be empty and the, the patients will be left uh, at their own. So also not a very nice solution. So, the <coughs> sorry, the unsatisfied constraints or the constraints that you uh, remove from your um, uh, from your model can be interpreted as some penalty, right? These are constraints you cannot satisfy. Um, and if you weigh this kind of penalty, you weigh the uh, constraints that have to be um, to be um, satisfied or not, you can find some very fine-grained uh, penalties, some very fine-grained um, solution to this. Uh, and this is actually how uh, such problems are, are very often times uh, solved. Um, so this is one way of, of doing it, but instead we can also um, take a look at, instead of removing constraints from the model entirely, um, to violate them by just a tiny amount. So uh, logical co constraints such as, uh, uh, such as uh, this junction, for example, they can just be uh, violated or not. But numerical constraints, well, they can be violated by a small bit, right? It's, it's more fine-grained again. Um, so, for example, um, this is, uh, sorry, this is um, what is done in feasibility restoration. So you modify the constraints rather than just removing them entirely from, from your model. Um, and this is called uh, relaxation. So the idea is that you have some kind of constraint. Let's say this is your, your feasible region. Um, well, you will push that feasible region a bit to, towards uh, the outside, so you get more solutions, uh, but not just remove that boundary entirely from your, uh, from your more feasible space. That's the idea behind these um, constraint relaxations. Uh, so you can implement this using uh, Slack variables, um, and each Slack or the Slack will indicate how far your um, feasible region will be, will be pushed. And of course, you want to minimize some kind of uh, aggregate over your Slack variables. Um, so if we um, apply this, this ID to our problem, we can, for example, um, consider the, uh, the cover constraints. So uh, how many nurses should work on, on a, a given day. And this will allow shifts to be slightly under or overstaffed, uh, depending on how uh, your Slack variables are, are uh, assigned. So if we take a look at this, so normally our, our normal constraints will be that the number of nurses should be equal to the requirement, um, but instead we add some uh, Slack variables, namely it can be slightly understaffed or overstaffed, uh, but they have to be, um, well that's, that's under or overstaff should be, should be minimal of course. Um, so we, again, um, have some uh, kind of Slack model in, in our factory. Uh, so we had a decision model before, now it's uh, some kind of optimization model, um, which includes some, some Slack variables. And we want to minimize some aggregate over the Slack variables. So let's start with a very easy aggregate, um, minimizing the global violation. So just the, the sum 
of all of these slacks should be minimized. Um, so that's very nice. Uh, for example, here you can see that uh, this is this is fairly good solution. We don't minimize, uh, we don't violate too many constraints. Um, but for example, here uh, there's only one um, one nurse working. So again, not not very not very nice for that for that nurse on uh, to work uh, on that Saturday. So instead uh, by of um, minimizing the global violation, let's minimize the maximum violation. So we all always have some nurses at least in our in our hospital. Uh, so if we do that, well, this is much nicer. So the minimal um, staff working is, is two in this case. Um, but we have violated a lot of constraints, right? The, the, the amount of red uh, slacks is, is huge. So that's not, uh, not very good. So instead we can um, also minimize the number of violated constraints. So minimize the, the number of uh, cover constraints that are actually not, not satisfied. Um, and if we do that, again, we get some, some smaller number, uh, but now we have two, um, two days where only one nurse is working. Um, but these, these Slack approaches, they're very, very flexible. Um, and so instead of doing one of the previous approaches, well, uh, we can uh, do minimize a combination of them uh, by, for example, using multi-objective optimization problem. Um, and this will uh, be a much nicer way uh, to, to staff, to under or over staff uh, this hospital in this case. And so these slacks really are a very, um, a very fine-grained way to um, tailor your, um, your solution a little bit. Um, and this is also how we can actually find a solution uh, by violating some constraints. And it's, it's also how, uh, how these problems are solved in practice. And so now we find a solution. Uh, well, you might also have some questions about it, and uh, Demos will uh, explain to you how we can explain those questions uh, to a user as well. Thank you very much. So we explained now the unsatisfiability, how to uh, explain to the user why something is unsatisfiable and how to correct this. But what happens if you actually find the solution and you are not satisfied with it? So in order to do that in our model, we will have to reformulate it as optimization model, having hard constraints the requirements that cannot really be uh, violated because the hospital would not be able to operate. And as soft constraints, some preferences of the hospital and of uh, the nurses. And the goal is uh, very similar to what Inas uh, mentioned before, to minimize the penalty of unsatisfied preferences. So if we try to do that here, we can uh, find a solution very fast, and we can see here the total penalty that, uh, based on the violations of the preferences, it's actually a very nice uh, pr solution in this case. However, what happens if the user is not actually satisfied because of some constraints that were not imposed in the model or for some reasons? So first of all, of course, we can give to the user alternative solutions. Multiple optimal solutions may exist in the same problem with the, the same penalty. So first of all, let's try to use the solve all function. We will have a solution limit of three to not overwhelm you, but you, are, of course, can find more. And present to the user these uh, alternative solutions in order to choose from which one of those the user prefers and uh, implements in his schedule. However, the user may not like the solution, not because of some specific assignments, but because he wants a better solution and wants to understand why I can't find a better solution than this. Why is the penalty so high? So the goal here is to explain to the user which constraints in, uh, in combined with the objective function, why uh, you cannot find a solution with a lower penalty. So the logic here is to just reduce the problem to unsatisfiable by adding a constraint saying find a better solution than the best you found before, the constraint uh, saying that the objective value should be better, and then just solve once again. You will see the solver answer is false, so we can use any of the techniques presented previously by Inas in order to explain this unsatisfiability. 
Uh, however, the user may want to actually change some parts in the solution by hand or find the changes to the model. So we now go to conversational explanations. Let's see now uh, the case where the user wants to change the solution that came by the solver. Some, some assignments may not be what the user wants. Some preferences or constraints that were not given in the model as uh, said before. So the user can just give, first of all, the assignment directly to the solver, the assignment that he, was, he wants to the solver as a constraint, like Robert uh, does not want to work on the first Saturday. Robert will be our friend in this part, remember him. So Robert uh, requests to have a zero to not work on that day. We post it as a hard constraint and we now find the solution again with the total penalty being 608. However, let's see our solution. Compared to the previous solution that we saw to the user, there are really too many changes, the green borders around the cells. So the user spent some time to study the previous solution. After some time, decided that I don't like this assignment and I want a new one with this assignment included. And now we presented a very different solution and has to spend a lot of time to study the solution again. That's not always desirable. So we probably want to slightly change the solution. We may want to change as few parts as possible. Of course, there will be a trade-off between difference uh, with the previous solution and the penalty you actually have. Because the number of changes was high, we, because we tried to find also, again, the optimal. But if we want to minimize the, the number of changes with the previous solution, we can do it by imposing a very simple constraint, exactly because uh, of the capabilities of the library, we can just say that the NERS view must be not equal to the uh, optimal solution values, maximum three times. The sum of it has to be less or equal to three. So if we solve again with this uh, constraint, we can see that we found a solution with only three changes. Of course, the three can change to more or less, depending on our needs. We can see that the penalty is much higher, so if we want a better solution, we can uh, allow more changes. However, the user, okay, he got a solution, very nice solution with a very few changes, but the user wants to understand what changes should happen to the model. So we make the change, the model uh, gets this change on the next solution we will ask to, from the model next time, we'll consider this constraint and we are, or this preference. And we are not going to change the solution again and again every time. So let's go now to the counterfactual explanations where the model uh, tries to explain to the user what changes must, the, the explanation system, sorry, must, what changes must be made to the model to uh, satisfy the given assignment or constraint. So given a model with linear objective function, we can have, we can set a foil Y which is a set of constraints or assignments that must be included in the optimal solution. And the goal is to find new objective function, new weights, basically, that such that the uh, Y, the foil, is included in that optimal solution. So let's see again our optimal solution. We have this solution here. And now let's ask our friend Robert if he's happy. No, he's not happy, but let's see why. So Robert had these preferences, and some of them were denied, as we can see here. So which preferences from Robert were denied? These two. So Robert had two preferences, that to work on Thursday and Friday for the first week, that were not satisfied. But Robert actually cared for these preferences more, especially for the, his request to work on Friday. It was very important for him to work on Friday. So he's not happy with this specific preference not being satisfied, so let's isolate it. And now let's try to minimally change his own preferences in order to uh, find a solution including this. Of course, we want to change only his preferences. We, want, we do not want to mess with other nurses' preferences to satisfy his needs. So uh, we isolate above in the foil that preferences that, that preference that we, he does not want to have his request on Friday one denied, and the other preferences 
of Robert uh, in these two sets. So we have the foil and the rest of them. And uh, we can give it to a very nice inverse optimization model with a multi-solver main sub-problem sub algorithm. Here, the inverse optimize that is uh, implemented and give the foil and the allowed to change preferences. And we now found a solution with total penalty 608 instead of 607 by just changing one request to wait two. So here it says that one request of Robert must be, be done, must be more important, have a higher weight in order to have his uh, more important preferences set in the foil to be satisfied. So in, in this way, we, exp we can explain a solution. We can explain what caused something like why we cannot find a better solution than the optimal one and also have some uh, interaction with the user to slightly change the solution or even the model with our framework. So now Tias will come to conclude our tutorial. All right, <coughs> thank you very much, Dimos. So indeed, uh, we've reached uh, almost the end, so I'd just like to conclude with a few more slides. So the work that we're doing here uh, fits within uh, ERC Consolidator grant that I have called uh, Conversational Humanware Technology for Optimization. So its ambitions goes much further. Yeah, with our, our aim is to develop systems, to investigate systems that allow for co-creation of uh, constraint optimization solutions, in including both learning, explanation, stateful interaction, and so forth. So uh, if you want to know some more about this project, or if it aligns with your interest, uh, feel free to reach out. So uh, to recap, uh, we've talked about explainable constraint programming. We've uh, reviewed a large part of the literature in preparation for this tutorial, and we saw these three patterns, uh, causal or deductive explanations, contrastive explanations, and then more interactive conversational explanations and we've re-implemented a range of algorithms uh, that we've just demoed to you. So there's our, there are, of course, uh, many connections to the wider explainable AI research uh, field that is currently um, uh, progressing very fast. And so there's very nice work in explanations in planning that has relations to what we've presented here, minimal and satisfiable goal sets, model reconciliation, and so forth. Also in the knowledge representation and reasoning um, uh, research field, there's been work on explanations for justifications, uh, as well as languages for languages like ASP and O, uh, with which connections can be made. And then um, also even in a, in a machine learning field, uh, there's a family of, of techniques where people use formal explanations, uh, so model-based explanations, uh, of, of uh, black box machine learning models. And actually some of these techniques uh, have very strong similarities. For example, our implicit hitting set based uh, and so forth. Um, so what are some of the challenges uh, in, in, uh, when looking at explaining Kosenko programming specifically? And so I think first and foremost, we've presented a number of explanations, but many other potential questions can be defined, as well as definitions for how such a query, how such an explanation question should be answered. What is the, the, the actual question that a system should be able to answer, and how should that answer look like? There's uh, still um, much more possible there. Another uh, big theme is computational efficiency, and so solving one constraint programming uh, can be uh, exponential, right? it can be an NP-hard uh, problem, and so being able to explain that uh, makes you reach uh, computational efficiency issues, which are, of course, uh, very interesting uh, to overcome. Um, another aspect is that of explanation selection. And so if you've defined your explanation type as well as the answer format properly, there could be many explanations uh, that can be found. And so how to select or how to, how to specify which one is desirable, which one is the best one. Also in terms of user interaction, I think this, this last category, the conversational one, is the least developed. And this actually touches both on uh, visualization techniques, but also what about statefulness of interaction? Uh, what about actually conversational? Uh, so we've shown natural language description of constraints, but the natural language side, especially with recent developments, can be pushed uh, much further. And then finally, 
uh, a theme that is shared by all explainable AI work is uh, the challenge of how to evaluate your explanations. Yeah? There's a range of choices to be made. It can be purely on the computational side. It can be in terms of uh, expressivity, for example, but also user surveys and user studies are important, um, and, and, and so a range of evaluations should be performed uh, to guide our findings. So, and to conclude, we've looked at explanations, unsaid, sad, opt. Uh, this category of causal explanations, actually in all cases, this could be related back to finding a must or finding an optimal and satisfiable uh, subset. And so that's really a key concept there. We had a, a very strong need for programmable multi-solver tooling when, uh, when re-implanting these uh, explanation techniques or when developing new ones. And for that, we believe that the CPMPy library is a very good fit, and we're actually co-developing it so that it remains a good fit. There's many, many more open, challenging, and exciting problems to work on, especially these uh, conversational explanations and even contrastive explanations are much, much less researched, uh, but have a lot of potential. And then a little technical side note is that we really benefit from incremental solvers, and so incremental CP solvers can really help this research line a lot. Um, and so we, uh, every time that we have resources, at the end of the slide, uh, you can find some more references and many, many more exist. So uh, thank you for your attention. We hope you enjoyed this. And uh, we'll take some questions here in the room, uh, but I'll stop the recording here. Thank you very much.